This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Unfortunately, we need to open the podcast with sad news about the passing of Rachel Held Evans. It is generally my practice not to mention the news of the day in the podcast. However, because I recorded my conversation with today's guest, Kathleen B. Shannon, before the passing of Rachel Held Evans on May 4th, 2019, and the absence of mention of Rachel and her huge impact on the world of deconstruction would be a glaring omission. Therefore, I'd like to take this opportunity to make a few statements. First to admit that I did not have very much overlap with Rachel or her work, having deconverted from a more theologically conservative evangelicalism directly into humanism and no longer staying within the framework of Christianity, I mostly missed her work for myself. I have been aware of her work and her impact on progressive Christianity, but unfortunately I have not yet had the privilege to read her books, an omission I plan to remedy. Having said that, a tenet of my brand of humanism, Secular Grace, is to recognize an ally regardless of their metaphysical persuasion. And Rachel Held Evans was very much an ally. I recognize a religious humanism in Rachel's work, though she may not have identified as such. Rachel was open to hearing the voices of atheists, and she was willing to call out the hypocrisy of evangelicalism. She pushed for LGBTQ inclusion within the church and for progressive issues. When she was no longer welcome within evangelicalism, as Hemet Menta, the friendly atheist, eloquently put it, quote, she burned all the right bridges, end quote. Since Rachel's passing, I've been inspired by many of her quotes I've seen online, and I'd like to read one here. Quote, If you are looking for verses with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to oppress women, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to liberate or honor women, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. If you are looking for an outdated, irrelevant, and ancient text, you will find it. If you are looking for truth, believe me, you will find it. This is why there are times when the most relevant, constructive question to bring to the text is not, what does it say, but what am I looking for? I suspect Jesus knew this when he said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. If you want to do violence in this world, you will always find the weapons. If you want to heal, you will always find the balm. End quote. This is from Rachel's book, A Year of Biblical Womanhood. I also asked today's guest Kathleen B. Shannon if she would like to make a statement, and she had this to say. Quote, Rachel Held Evans' passing hit me harder than I expected. What hit me even harder was the backlash from some of the religious community being horrible about her death, within an hour of its posting. I knew some didn't like her, but holy cow, really? Being that repulsive within an hour of her passing. Pulpit and pen, of course, had been awful from the time she was announced to be in a coma. I mean, who does this? Did their mamas not teach them any better? Maybe the golden rule is really brass, and it has tarnished. End quote. Ultimately, Rachel's life and work pointed toward a graceful interpretation of Jesus' teachings, a joyful perspective on life, and a very humanist perspective on how we need to love one another. If the outpouring of love for Rachel online is any indication, she will be deeply missed. May her family and all those who were inspired by her work find peace in their grief. I'll leave the link to her family's GoFundMe page. If you feel so compelled, please consider giving. I do plan on doing an episode on secular grief in the near future. This is a topic that is particularly poignant for those of us who have deconstructed and deconverted. Moments like these with the loss of a beloved public figure remind us of our finite humanity and force us to face death head on. Love each other fiercely while you have time. On to today's show. My guest today is Kathleen B. Shannon. Kathleen is a psychotherapist. She is a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State and a licensed professional counselor in North Carolina. We throw around the term religious trauma often, but what does that actually mean? I asked Kathleen to be on the show to talk about religious trauma from an expert's perspective. What does psychology have to say on the subject, and what does she find in her practice? As you are about to hear, Kathleen has her own deconstruction story. 
She attended a very conservative Christian Bible college. She subsequently became a psychotherapist and learned that the topic of religion was a no-no in the therapy room. Even though her patients were describing their toxic religious experiences as the root problem. I began seeing Kathleen's work on Twitter, and a mutual respect has grown between us. I really appreciate the work that she does. Please join me in my conversation with Kathleen B. Shannon as we talk about religious trauma, outrage exhaustion, and what Kathleen calls equanimity. And now I give you Kathleen B. Shannon. Shannon, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Kathleen, I want you to tell people about your practice. Uh, I understand that you're a psychotherapist, but you were just explaining to me off air what, what that means. Well, uh, I am licensed in two separate states. I'm licensed in Washington State, and in, in Washington State, I have the title of licensed mental health counselor, and in North Carolina, where I live now, the license is licensed professional counselor. So I can do counseling, mental health counseling, uh, in both of those states, and I do telehealth for people who live in Washington State, and I do some telehealth here in North Carolina if they're too, too far away. Ah, fantastic. Uh, and I think what we'll get to is your practice and maybe the specific question of uh, what is religious trauma. But uh, I had read your blog and you tell the story of your Bible college experience and kind of your religious background. And I'd, I'd love it if you just tell that story for the listeners. Okay. I was raised in an environment, um, I would probably say to be safe, I was probably culturally Christian, although I don't even really know what that is. Um, I guess if somebody identifies as a cultural Jew, I would probably be a cultural Christian in that term. Yeah. Uh, it, I was not really raised with anything. I wasn't churched, as it were. Um, Mom always had this idea of, you know, if you have a problem, you just open whatever book. The Bible is lovely and point to a passage and it's going to be great and wonderful. Right. And it just kind of, I mean, it was sweet and it was kind, but it just didn't, I don't know, it was just something little sideways about that with me. Well, I wasn't necessarily a, a terribly popular kid in school, was kind of a loner, kind of hung out on my own. And I graduated from high school and I went off to about three miles where I live from where I live now is a conference center where I got to work for the summer. And I went there during the summers for the YMCA and mm -hmm. it was wonderful. It was great and wonderful. So I got to work there. Well, a lot of the staff there were other college kids and it was part of that situation and they were all well not all but 99 percent of them were from the deep south and they were from steeped in that deep religious tradition most most of them probably southern baptist presbyterian things like that bible belt people bible belt people and they were all about it and they were i mean we even had cassettes of michael w smith and the whole of yeah. that yeah. And that's the only music that played in the dining hall while we were cleaning the tables and whatnot. And people tried reaching out to me and trying to convert me. Well, you know, I wanted to be a part of the group. I wanted to belong. So, you know, I did the cute little sinner's prayer and on page eight of some tract somewhere. Yeah. And it was great and it was wonderful. And, you know, I got to be sort of in the in group, but it was very strange. It was, it was just, it was weird, but I accepted it. It was all wonderful. And I got to sit at the cool kids table and it was all good. Yeah. Uh, not realizing that there wasn't anybody at the not cool kids table because everybody was already part of that group. Right. Uh, very odd, very strange. So I somehow deemed that I have been called by God after my first year at university of Florida, which was, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Florida. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, whoa. <laughs> Yeah. It was an eye opener, especially, you know, especially, you know, freshly saved and all. Yeah. So I got called to Bible college. So off I go to Bible college and I didn't realize it at the time, but I had chosen a particularly rigorous, pretty conservative fundamentalist. And this was in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. It was the rise of the moral majority and the whole religious right. right. And they had grabbed hold of that place and, took her to the moon yeah, and I was in it and I didn't know because everybody else had been raised with Bible stories and everything. And I'm just trying to play catch up and I'm just thinking, okay, just love your neighbor and everything's going to be fine. Golden rule, the whole thing. I'm figuring, yeah. well, how, 
how bad can it be, right? You just golden rule it. You know, how, how tough is this really? <laughs> Basically, don't be an obnoxious piece of work and it's going to be a good thing. So I tried to not be an obnoxious piece of work, but then people were being obnoxious pieces of work, but it was okay because it was biblical. Mm. I didn't know what to do with that, yeah. but I just kept trying to catch up because I didn't know where I was. I was like, okay, I don't know this story and you're quoting something that sounds kind of official. So I look it up and I go, yes, yes. Well, I get there. I look back up a little bit. When I got there, it was, you know, you had a, a book this thick saying, you know, you will do all these things in this book. And do they send this to you beforehand? No, of course not. Don't be dumb. <laughs> right. We're going to send it to you now. And we're going to have everybody all, all of us are going to sign it together in blood or whatever we signed it in. And yes, and turned it in. And I'm looking at this stuff going, I mean, it was, it was serious. We had to have, I mean, we had dating hours. Mm, I couldn't yeah. date any more than like 10 hours in a week. And, and there had to be you know, 12 inches of space between me and anybody sitting next to me. You got to leave it for the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. And there was a whole no contact thing. It was, it was a hot mess. Yeah. And it was, it was really creepy, but I didn't think it was creepy because it was godly. I definitely had a very similar experience early nineties for me. God love you. Maybe not quite as conservative, but, but really conservative. A curfew at night. And, you know, I just remember feeling like I was being treated like a child. Here I was, you know, 19, 20 years old. And it's like you're in grade school again. You know, we're going to hold your hand and tell you exactly how to behave. But we would theoretically hold your hand because of the no contact thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> only in theory. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a mess. And I was there for almost four years. Well, towards the end of my last year there, I dated a guy and he and I had a great time and he was fun and he was funny and it was delightful. And he had dated some friend of mine the year before and they had broken up and it was some kind of odd situation, but we did, I didn't, I, hell, I was just trying to stay alive. Yeah. And there was this sort of murmur about this guy named Mark or somebody, I don't remember who the hell it was anyway, and I didn't think any more about it. Well, evidently this person that I dated um, came out. Mm. to me and broke up with me because I are not male. And I was like, well, okay. And this, this again was the first, I mean, I was so sheltered. God love me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> honest to God. I didn't, I didn't know anything about the LGBT, LGBT population. Yeah. And in the eighties, you didn't talk about it. I mean, those are the people who got AIDS and they deserved it, at least according to CBC. Yeah. But um, <laughs> If you didn't live in sin. Especially not in a conservative Bible college. Yes. Holy cow. Yeah, no yeah. way. No way. So at any rate, I went ahead and, you know, we broke up and I was heartbroken, of course. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really know anything about it. It's just like, okay, just be a good person. Try to get him the help that he needs if he needs help. Because evidently, I don't know if this was DSM one time and that was still a, an illness. I don't even remember. Right, I don't know right. when they changed that in the DSM, to be honest with you. Because that was an illness back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I had diagnosis and everything, and you evidently could get treated for that. That's kind of a scary thought. Um, anyway. And yet we really haven't learned that lesson yet. We still have conservative churches that are trying to do gay conversion therapy. So, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God love them. Oof. Anyway, <laughs> so I went ahead and, you know, I just tried to be nice and stayed under the radar. And evidently his old girlfriend started talking to him again, and they managed to mend things up a little bit. And I was like, all right, good. They mended things up. And I was too busy trying to get my butt graduated. Mm -hmm. And evidently he said, I am not going to date you. I do not want to date you to this old girlfriend. Well, evidently she threatened to go to the administration saying outing him and the whole mess wow. and saying she had info and all this other stuff. Well, here I am talking on the phone and out comes this, you know, down the hall comes his old girlfriend. And when you're off the phone, I want to talk to you, me and, you know, Carol oh, yeah. and, and Lisa want to talk to us. Like, all right, fine. Yeah. So I go in there and my bestiest bestie that I had told also was women's dorm council president. Oh, no. And it was a leadership position. Well, I told her after I'd broken up with Jeff and what had happened and whatnot, and the fact that we had gotten physical a couple of times, and it, we didn't even have sex. We just kissed. That was it. Right. <laughs> well, evidently, you know, <laughs> for all that, <laughs> holy crow. Yeah. Anyway, the three of them said, we need to go down to the prayer room 
Of course. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. So in the first floor in the breezeway is this cinder block room with no windows and a sort of a half working fluorescent light in the ceiling and they sh bring me in there and we all shut the door and I'm like oh crap we're all dead yeah <laughs> says, well if you don't go to the administration we will because we know that you and jeff were physical wow I was like, wait what the fresh hell is this yeah, yeah and i was like wait what and i'm just sitting here going wait what's going on i don't even understand and then jeff calls me and he says you know she's trying to get me kicked out and, da -da 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 -da. and i said don't worry don't worry i'm gonna work on that don't you worry about a thing well now i'm worried i might get kicked out so i'm thinking well yeah. i don't know what the hell i gotta do but i was like you know let me go work on somebody else because this will figure that they're gonna realize this is bs this is you know come on anybody with any sense there's got to be an adult in the room somewhere yes. there are <laughs> the adults have left the building yes. anyway, so went ahead and I tried to help him out well they said no thank you and they kicked him out and wow then they came after me and said you know and they had some sketchy stuff on me he said she said nothing yeah. with any nothing with any paper to it right. and I was kicked out and they said you shall not be back on campus lest we shall call out the you know, was it Lexington County or Richland County Sheriff's Office and have you, wow. you know, forcibly dragged off. <laughs> yeah, that's super serious. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, wait a minute, what happened to Golden Rule? I figured if I just did Golden Rule, we'd be all good. I guess it's only gold for some. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds like they were uh, nervous about this coming out into the light and having to defend what is ultimately a horrific uh, policy to kick people out. You know, and they were just getting rid of you before it became became an issue, it sounds like. I, evidently, because I'd broken some rules in the rule book. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The rule book. On page, <laughs> yeah, page 105, subsection C. <laughs> exactly. With some sketchy Bible versus sort of half support the thing. I'm like, right. wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I just really related uh, to that story. I also recognize when you talk about being kind of a cultural Christian, I, you know, I grew up with a cultural Christian family where, you know, they talked about God occasionally, but with no seriousness, nobody was going to church. Right, right. And I, you know, I always joke that I, the, to quote Douglas Ad Adams, I was constantly asking, who is this God character anyway? <laughs> and in my late teens, I had some dramatic family things that took place. I'll try not to lay down on the couch for you here, but uh, <laughs> I'll send you a bill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had some Christian friends, you know, and, and, same thing, said the sinner's prayer, and I was, I was all in. I was about 18 or 19 at the time. I had a, a youth pastor that said, you know what? You could go to Bible college. And that was legitimately the first time where somebody was you know, saying that I could do something positive in the world, and I just ate it up. You know? And so I found myself at Bible college and, and didn't get quite kicked out, but uh, you know, I, there was definitely lots of things going on there that uh, would not have. You were smart enough to walk out yeah, of the room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what the heck? A lot of things that maybe didn't line up with the uh, manual, let's just say. <laughs> so, uh, Kathleen, we interacted with each other on Twitter a few times, and I just think there's a, a level of mutual respect that, that we develop. And the reason I asked you to be on, on the show is, you know, I'm just some guy. I used to be a youth pastor a long time ago. And God love you. After uh, my deconversion, you know, just looking around going, man, you know, I see all these people going through the exact same process that I am or that I already have and making the same mistakes. You know, what can we do about that? The hot new topic of the day is, is this idea of religious trauma. And so I'd like you to explain what that is uh, and how you deal with that in your practice. Well, and that's interesting because there is no, there's not been a really a solid definition as to what religious trauma is. Mm -hmm. It's because I get Google alerts just to see what's going on with who and doing what and whatnot. And sure. I swear to goodness, I've gotten 400 in the past year, Google alerts on whatever the heck, and nobody will agree on what it is. And all these come from various blogs and Pathios and Reddit, which is, well, Reddit. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> God love it. But um, it's, it, there's no real strong definition of if I were to create a definition, mm -hmm. I would say that it would be some psychological trauma that mm -hmm. is based around or within a religious system. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's a if it's a system that will 
by its own authority oppress or marginalize or demonize or exclude or or pretty much just cause psychological abuse within a religious context. Right, right. If I were to really put it there. And I was very strongly suggested when I was in graduate school 20 years ago, they said, you will not do that. Do you understand me? You cannot bring that up in the therapy room. That is for the priests and the rabbis and the blah, blah. Right. I said, dude, if that is what caused them the problem, they have to have somewhere to go. And they were like, you will not be doing that. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I haven't, you know, I'm not a newbie at bucking the system. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, before that became a trendy term, were you seeing that in your practice? Were you seeing people bring up? I was, and nobody had a religious, nobody had a term for it. There right. was nothing that they could, they were, they were like, well, there was church, and they were kind of weird, and then we did this, and we did that. And it, and I hate using this term. I hate using the term cult, because the people who were left in the cult, these people who were on my couch still love those people. Oh, Yeah. And there are hands full of the people in the cult who are not of the cult. Mm -hmm. They're just there because they're there or they buy into some of it and not all of it. Right. So I, I try to eschew terms that are very denigrating, even for the, the group that may be doing the perpetrating because not all and all this mess. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I try to focus on, one of the mistakes I see as people going through deconstruction and deconversion is you know you naturally feel anger, and I think we'll talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. And right at the moment that you're kind of vulnerable and angry, and you've got all this new information, it's super easy to lash out at the very people who you care about the most. Yep. And those are the people you want to maintain those relationships with. Mm -hmm. Or you end up in another group that's just as angry at those people and engaging in the same behavior, just on a different premise. Right. Yes. Definitely. My whole thing is that is you know people are what bring meaning to our lives. Our relationship yeah. is the mm -hmm. is relationships with others, our families, our friends. Uh, you know that's the meaningful thing in our lives, and that's the thing we need to be cultivating. And as soon as we start to treat other people as less than human, or or without their full humanity, mm -hmm. uh, you know we've gone astray in some way or another. Regardless of which ethical or religious uh, you know moral background you come from, I think that is pretty well agreed upon. Yeah. And it's even gotten to the point of if we disagree and you're wrong, that somehow now wrong is equated with evil. Right. Yeah. And because of this, I now have the right to destroy you. Yeah. Well, this is a good segue into another topic I wanted to ask about. And, and that is online, uh, in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, what have you, I find that even though my best intentions are to try to speak a positive humanist message, sometimes <laughs> my ire gets up. And in fact, I have to confess that just prior to our call, I may or may not have engaged with an apologist. Uh, there are times where, you know, even when my, I'm trying hard to do the right thing, that the worst part of my personality can come out. And so I guess the question I want to ask you is, do you think that the social media and the ability to connect online is a net positive or a net negative? Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one, honestly. Um, I went to a, a speaker who said, you know, get online, get with your people. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of good until it's not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because then you start hearing your own people and you're just basically in an echo chamber. Right. which is never safe. Uh, but then going out and trying to practice equanimity with somebody who is looking for a fight is also kind of a, a sticky wicket. Um, right. I would tend to say it can be a net positive, mm -hmm. especially when you can also have an offline relationship with those people. If you can have an opportunity to actually do what we're doing right now, actually meeting right. up and, and, and talking, I think it's wonderful. The problems that I see in social media and, and elsewhere is where all of a sudden we now have this anonymity and all I am is fingers on a keyboard and I can just rip into somebody. Right. In fact, that's really why spiritual trauma recovery got launched 
was I had been done with the church, completely done with the church. And then I went over to the other side of the world to the free range jungle safari of woo woo. And that just uh-huh. kind of got a little too weird. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Is there anybody sane anymore? Yeah. And I just kind of left the whole mess until the friend who led me to the Lord, as it were, mm-hmm. um, lost his son to suicide oh, to no. people who were bullying him on the internet. And they were people who were arch enemies of his father. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely a, a, a potential dark side. Oh, way dark side, way dark side. And the funny thing is, is that had they been harassing him sexually, they mm-hmm. could have gotten time for it. That's a crime. Right. But because it wasn't sexual in nature, the cyber harassment, there's nothing wrong with that. Hmm. Wow. For an adult to a child, only if it's sexual in nature, is it illegal? What? Yeah. And words matter, right? You know, yes, like, uh, they what do. you say to a person uh, can affect them in a deep way. It can. It can. I mean, that's how we develop cultures and languages and people. That's how we develop relationships and how we destroy them. Mm-hmm. What I've uh, you know, struggled with is the attempt to build online communities. So uh, we did a, a thing we called Secular Hangouts, where we tried to do Kind of this kind of thing, a Google Hangout with three or four people at a time and, and just talking about what our experience is going through this process. And, and I think it, that is wonderful and I want to see more, more and more of that, but it is extremely difficult to pull off uh, on, online. So I agree with you that trying to find the kind of the in real life connectivity, you know, with like uh, meetup.com or something like that to find anything, right? to just meet people is, uh, is, is really, really important. Well, now we even have a term for it, like deconversion, deconstruction. I mean, when I was going through it, there was no word for that. You, there was no anything. What, what, right. what is this thing that I'm experiencing? Now that we have Dr. Google, you know, you can just figure out I'm yeah. losing my faith. And all of a sudden you get these words associated with it. Like, okay, this, this is a thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Let's talk about that for a minute. I think one of the things that I initially struggled with was just was the language. What do I call this thing? I personally have landed on talking about deconversion, mm-hmm. by which I personally mean having had a faith, a life altering, all encompassing faith at one point in time in my life, subsequently coming to the realization that I no longer felt its claims were true. And now on the other side of that, trying to to live an ethical good life without without that previous framework what is your preferred language surrounding that well i would say i've probably more in the deconstruction Mm -hmm. because i still I, i don't even know if i believe anything to be perfectly honest with you um i'm more of an experiential person i've come to realize Mm -hmm. I try something on. Does it feel good? Does it work good? Does it work good in a variety of contexts that I could use for more than 10 minutes? Then yeah, (laughs) then this is a good thing. (laughs) But um, in fact, that's often how I practice my psychotherapy is it's more experiential is that a lot of it is cognitive to be sure. But let's put on that cognition. Let's put on that that framework. And does it does it work right? Could I go out in the world and believe in this? And if I don't, what happens if I throw it away? Right. So one of the other terms that I struggle with is this idea of spirituality. I think that that, that term has some value. Mm-hmm. I, when I use it, I mean something internal and motivating and life-changing in some way or another, but I personally mean it in a naturalistic a naturalistic way. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other other words that describe that, that uh, maybe the secular community would have an easier time uh, accepting? Um, I like the term synergy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Reason being is that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Mm, yeah. So there's something out there that is not necessarily measurable that somehow makes the whole mess of it a lot more cohesive and can give it a a greater sense of awe and sense of wonder. Yes. And I think that as human beings, we are wired to seek after 
the awe, you know, yes. you know, and so from a psychotherapist point of view, what do you think is happening when we experience awe, whether that's religious or whether that's standing out in nature or looking up at the stars? What, what is that exactly? Well, from my perspective, if somebody still has the experience of awe, there is some hope. There yeah. is a beautiful sense of hope. When someone has lost their sense of awe and they have all the answers and everything is fine and everything is wonderful, scratch underneath that about, yeah, about a half inch and you're going to find depression, you're going to find anxiety, you're going to find all of that. Yeah. Um, to have to have the right answer is so soothing to an anxious soul, you can't even know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to just not even be enamored by anything is to not be let down again to the depressed soul. Right, right. The other thing that I, that I really recognize, and I think the deficiency in the secular side of, of things, is that we do need community. Yes. So I'm often saying, just because you have deconstructed or deconverted, or whichever your preferred term is, you've walked away from let's just say fundamentalist religion on some level does not mean that you don't need human connection. Uh, you mentioned in your story, belonging, being a part of the group. Yes. Tell us about what it is that we derive from belonging to a group. We derive a sense of identity. And then of course, then that can go overboard, you know, we get id Paul and everything else, but, yeah. um, but to be a part of a family, to be a part of a tribe, I mean, that's that's very important. Lone wolves don't do well. We're social creatures. We're social animals. And if you're the lone one off out there, they told us when we were doing evangelism explosion, go up to the person who is sitting by themselves. Yes. <laughs> I remember it well, yes. Right? And I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking, if I had just had a bunch of buds, I could have been saved from being saved. That would have been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we need community. We need to have a chance to talk and to dialogue. And we need, and I, there, I'm telling you, I live in a place. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. I would not live anywhere else on the planet. There is a dark side to where I live. And it is, there are people out there who are looking for opportunity to be offended on behalf of a group of which they do not belong. Because somehow their measure of being offended is somehow a measure of their morality. Mm, okay. Now, the old saying uh, of, you know, if you're not offended, you're not paying attention. They have taken this way, way, way too far. Right. I just want to sit and have dialogue with somebody. And I want to be able to assume positive intent of everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's part of how I try to practice my equanimity. Sometimes I walk into crazy groups that I should not be walking into. And then, <laughs> what yes. was I thinking? I mean, I'm really bad at equanimity. That's why I have to practice it a lot. So I <laughs> deliberately will go into groups. I know these people are nothing like me. I must sit here and try to make nice and do the good thing. And yeah. it is very hard. Yeah. It's very hard to not just lose my stuff and go off on them thinking, you walked in here. You knew this could happen. Yeah. I couldn't play the, I, but I didn't know card. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, not, when I was in Bible college, I could play the, I didn't know card because holy mother, I did not know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like your term equanimity. Uh, and I think one of the things that we bonded over was just giving people the benefit of the doubt, which yes. in includes what you've just said. You actually have to listen, sit down and listen to a person before you can hear their story and really understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And that's hard because that sometimes hard. they're going to yell and they're going to think you're part of the problem. And mm -hmm. sometimes I am, <laughs> or at least I'm a part of a group that was a part of the problem. Right. And if I can, if I can not get offended by them getting mad at me, if I can say, you know what, as a part of that group, I can see where you're coming from with that. And that really does suck. And I am very sorry. And I wish I could make it up to you. I don't know what to do to make it better for you. Can you help me out with that? And right. then hear what they have to say. Cause sometimes they may say, you know what, this is what it would be to, to actually make amends in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in our pr particular political moment in history, you know, regardless of which uh, side a person comes from, you mentioned earlier that we've made wrongness into evil. 
Yes. And we've also made, you know, the other side into evil. And I'll be totally honest that I am just totally guilty of doing that myself. Uh, but in order to, to hear each other, we have to not be offended just to even engage in the conversation. We have to get past the, that interface, that beginning point to actually get into a real conversation with someone with whom we disagree. Yes. And that is hard. That is very hard. Yeah. And uh, I think we also mentioned this idea of outrage exhaustion. Uh, and I want to preface just really quickly that I am not in any way suggesting that there are not things to be outraged about. <laughs> there, yes. there are those things aplenty. But when we step back and talk about my own self-care, my own health, if I am constantly in, in a state of outrage, what does that do to a person? Oh, my goodness. Outrage fatigue? I see it a lot. I see it a lot, especially living here where everybody's, you know, in some sort of morality competition as to who can be more outraged. Um, <laughs> that gets to be a little tiring even for me. Yeah. But if, you're, if your emotions are jacked up all the time and you're going around looking for a fight, I mean, that is going to be wear and tear on your body. That's wear and tear on your mind. You cannot heal. And if you're going to go to bed, because you know, you can't go to bed because you, you know, I'm still, I'm fighting with someone on the internet. I'll be there in a minute. Well, you're yes. never going to get any sleep. I mean, come on, let's get real. <laughs> yes. And that's where, you know, sleep. I've read an article today that, you know, you can, you can learn how to forget. Mm. And you can learn how to forget by actually that and there's an old thing in neuroscience that the neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you fire them enough, they're going to wire together a long, a long time. Mm -hmm. You can also have them be pruned. There are certain glial cells that will go out and while you're sleeping at night and go, you know, this one isn't doing very good. I think I'm going to snip that, going to snip that, going to snip that. But if you go to bed jacked up from, I just won a fight on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. What the heck? Yes. You're going to stew in that for eight, 10 hours. If you're lucky enough to get that much sleep, you yeah. know, you wake up in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, Oh, and another thing. And then go type out another. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's a famous uh, XKCD cartoon that is, you know, wait a minute, someone is wrong on the internet. Exactly. We have this oh. sense of, we have this feeling as though we, we cannot allow someone to say an incorrect thing, that it's my personal responsibility to correct that. Yeah, it's, well, and it's, there's a certain pattern of, of people that are like that. And these are the people out there that, Please let them work in IT. Mm -hmm. Let them work in architecture. Let them work in something where they can spot the trouble. I will yes. feel very safe with that person because <laughs> yes. that person will find every blessed thing wrong and I will be the safest person on the planet. Do not let them talk to people. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's grown into this addiction to being right. Yes. And, and, being right is incredibly addictive. It is. And then when you think, and I'm going to, because I do a lot of relationship work as well. And the Gottman say, you know, when, how do you win when you win an argument? Hmm. So you're having an argument with your partner and all of a sudden you win the argument. How do you win? Do you spike the football? Right. Or do you say, you know, I can still see your point and I know that must hurt. And then, you know, just chill and don't go around gloating about the fact that you won an argument. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I apologize. I don't remember the, uh, the woman's name, but I'll link it in the show notes. There's a YouTube Ted talk that I thought was just brilliant. And the uh, presenter asked the question, what does it feel like to be wrong? Mm. And everyone's response is, oh, it's horrible. It's embarrassing. It's, it, and, and she lets that go for a while. And then she says, no, the feeling of, of being wrong is exactly like feeling like you're right. The feeling of being informed that you were wrong is embarrassing. <laughs> 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 now I've been outed. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> And so the, the intoxicating nature of feeling absolutely vindicated and right, and what I call self-righteousness, oh, yeah. 
is, and I'm saying intoxicating, and I mean me. I find this just deeply intoxicating. It's it's so hard to to be self aware enough to recognize that and to try to lay that out and let go of it. But you still are though. So that shows that you have a level of self awareness of an aspect of yourself that is not necessarily a, a great aspect. Right. Yeah. No. Definitely. I. You know. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm falling on the sword here to say. You know. This is what I want to be like, not what I am like. Well, and I. I am of a of a belief that we really are a whole bunch of committees walking around. That yes. we're all about eight thousand selves in one thing, looking like a body. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not that we're, we have dissociative identity disorder. We just have a lot of people running around in our head. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. So let's turn around to back towards uh, the deconstruction process. I've, I've seen a, a number of people compare it to the Kubler-Ross stages of loss. Is, is that something that you think is true? And could you describe for us what that is? Well, I disagree. I just, I'm curious what you Well, it, it, I don't want to throw Kubler-Ross under the bus because she's, you know, she's done amazing work and done work in areas that people are really have been unwilling into until that time. However, it's not clean and it's not tidy. The stages of grief and, oh, okay, I can check that box. I can check that box. Mm. It's a hot mess. It's all over the place. Right. Um, losing one's religion losing one's faith, losing one's identity, if you have that all wrapped up in that, mm -hmm. um, it can be very difficult, especially if, you know, you were there on every Wednesday and twice on Sunday, and then you had the yeah. Tuesday afternoon, yeah, da, 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 and then the Thursday morning, and then the Friday coffee, and the da-da-da. You know, you were, church was your life, religion yeah. was your life, and if you didn't have a good prayer life in the beginning that you had to get up at 6.03 a.m., and you had to do it for at least 34 minutes and all this other Right stuff that you had to do, you know, go through the Bible in a year type of thing, mm -hmm. you know, then it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a weird thing. I mean, well, what do I do now? I'm up at 603. I've been up at 603 every morning for 27 years. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. My body is naturally waking up at that time or Wednesday. <laughs> I know I have something to do Wednesday. Right. <laughs> I used to have something to do Wednesday. Well, shit, what do I do now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have nothing to do. <laughs> Yes. And it's it's very interesting. It's if if your whole identity, if you were, you know, at the level of identity, if that's all you were and you lose that, when I work with folks with that, I'm saying, okay, that is a lot of what you did. Mm -hmm. And you still did more. Tell me about other things that you did. Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you went to work and it wasn't in the if Hopefully it wasn't in the ministry right. or let's say you went to baseball games or you went to movies or you played with your kids and it wasn't around some religious thing. I tried to identify the things that they did in their lives that didn't have a religious context, mm -hmm. that they could still have a role that wasn't defined by that, even though that culture wants to define everything, all of your roles through that lens and then proceed to break the lens, and then all of a sudden you're walking around and you can't see anything. Right. Um, I try to stay very neutral. I'm not going to bash their former faith. Mm -hmm. I will not praise their current faith. Right. It's I have to keep walking that very neutral path because I cannot afford to be influential in any way. Right. Aside from lawsuits, probably. But <laughs> um, it, it's more of the issue of, am I going to turn into the evangelist? Mm -hmm. And I can't afford to do that. Right. I mean, the only thing that I can, that I feel fortunate enough to have is that both my, what I'm selling and what's buying from me is the same person. Right. So it, when I start to have them access their inner resources, what strengths they have, because I come from a strengths-based background and an experiential background, that can usually help. Okay. Of course, then having to deal with the guilt of, I can't rely on me, I can only rely on God. Okay. Yeah. So, and then we start to get through that and go up underneath that and where, what helps with that. So it's, it's a loss of identity if their whole identity was in that. But then I start to find out, well, what parts might not have been in that? Mm. Or, you know, what, 
what aspect of you do you have a really good relationship with that may not have been influenced by that? Because I'm not going to say contaminated or hurt by, because there are certain aspects in it that were probably very helpful that they want to keep. Right. And you've just said that, you know, as human beings, we're kind of a walking committee in bodily form. And so human beings are three dimensional. So they're, we're more than just a particular metaphysical stance. And getting someone to recognize right. that is, is probably quite valuable. It is. It is. And I, I see people just all of a sudden light bulbs go on and I don't even turn on the light bulb. They turn on their own. And it's a beautiful thing to watch somebody yeah. cut on their own light bulb. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. It's, and it, it amazes me sometimes. And it's one of those, for lack of a better term, a spiritual moment. Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, for me, uh, a couple of the things that I think are unique to this process, maybe separate from loss in general, I definitely went through an angry phase. I definitely went through kind of a depressed phase, those kinds of things. But what I find unique is mm -hmm. uh, one is a loss of sense of control. And, and I attribute that primarily to the fact that within my faith, I could always do something. I could pray. And even though I now don't think that that had an actual effect on the world around me, it did something to me. And so I had a sense of, even if it was a false sense, a sense of control. So I've lost that. I initially felt a loss of control. Secondly, I felt shame for gullibility. Relooking back at, you know, the apologetic arguments, rereading the Bible and thinking, wow, how did I ever find this compelling? Why did I, what, I had just rose colored glasses on. How, how could I not have seen? So I felt really gullible. <laughs> You duped yourself. That's like the worst. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I feel, I feel like those are somewhat unique to this process that are, that are different. Do you find that, you know, do people recognize that? Or am I just a, a total? No, 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 no. That's, that's a strong theme. Um, being able to actually have some efficacy, some control over a situation is very, is very powerful is very powerful. Mm -hmm. The fact that you think you can pray and you call it good. And then all of a sudden you get a sense of relief about it because, you know, you just stop thinking about it and you had some control and boom, it's done. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you go to sleep that night, those little things can, you know, get cut off there and you're no longer thinking about it. And it's a good and wonderful thing. You got a good night's sleep. Yay. Good. Right, if it right. works, do it, do the thing, do all the things. And right. it's wonderful. Do your crystals, whatever you got rock and do your thing. But there's also the other part of the loss of control of, oh, shit, I got to think for myself. Yes. Yes. And I'm responsible. And oh, my <laughs> God, no. Yeah. At least if somebody told me what to do, I could go do the thing. And now I have no thing yes. that I have to do. And I got to come up with a thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So that's that's kind of it as well in terms of not only a loss of control, but a loss of having the ability to be controlled. Mm. So there's that. There's the, you know, how did I let myself get so duped? How did yes. I even dupe myself? I mean, part of the beauty of that, oddly enough, is also the saving grace of it. Mm -hmm. The people who have more psychological flexibility are the people who can get more well more quickly. Yeah. Because if you stay rigidly locked in a system and then that system is shattered, and you wonder, how did I manage to flip into that? You still have the, the psychological muscle, as it were, to be able to go stretch your mind into new and different ways. Yeah. So that's, that's a saving grace, oddly enough. Yeah, and, and I like to say that deconversion was the ultimate repentance. Yes. I was wrong. Yes. I was mistaken. <laughs> yes. And that... You know, I, th I find the irony of the fundamentalist perspective that set, suggests that this is an arrogance on our part. Mm -hmm. and I'm really saying I was mistaken. I was deeply mistaken. There, I, oddly enough, I ventured down to the Bible college um, <laughs> about a week or two ago and met somebody there that uh, was there right after I was there. He wasn't a student. He He's now a professor down there, but he and I chatted and had coffee and it was wonderful. And he told me about some 
Christian song that was through Vineyard or whatnot. And it basically was uh-huh. more of a, a pleading song that says, mostly prove me wrong. Mm, okay. That it was not a challenge of prove me wrong, but it was a plea. Please prove me wrong. Mm-hmm. And it was, it came from a, a, such a, a beautiful spot of humility that was just, it was, it was beautiful to hear. It was beautiful to hear anybody want to go that route rather than being arrogant and puffed up and prove me wrong type of a situation that they really were open at that time. Please prove me wrong. I have something here. I want to hear what else is going on. Yeah. Uh, that reminds me a little of um, Ryan Bell is the the host of the podcast Live After God. Yeah. And he talks about his deconversion process and the song, Say Something, I'm Giving Up On You, being just this deeply profound song. If you're not familiar with it, it's, this, it's, a, it's just a pop song, but it's a pleading, this, it's really about a relationship where one partner is just not responding, but it is this direct parallel to the experience of coming to doubt that these prayers are going to someone. Right. And, you're, and there's this pleading, you know, say something, (laughs) do something, please. You know, there's a desperation. There's this phase of desperation where you're, it's, it's, again, the irony is that the fundamentalist perspective is that, that we are rebelling against God and it's the opposite. It's like, I wanted God to be real so badly, but I took it seriously. If God is the God of the universe who, you know, created everything and, you know, can do anything. Why don't I see that? And and just that that desperation of you know, please, like you just said, prove me wrong. I want to be wrong here. I need to be wrong, actually. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and again, it, it it harkens back to our need for relationship mm, yes. with anything. You know, if you have a relationship with your partner, you expect some level of reciprocity. Right. If you're just you know, scream into the air and nothing's coming back or you're afraid to scream to the air because you're afraid the lightning bolt's going to come back. I mean, right. you know, it's, it, if there's no relationship, then, then what's the point? Yeah. Very, very well said. For those of us who are obviously not professional, but o- online and we're watching people go through this process and, we're trying to be of, of good will to, to help people through that. Is there any advice that you'd have for the helpers? And I'm going to ask you in a second, the advice for the people going through the process as well. So. Yeah. The helpers is always assume the person's in pain. Mm-hmm. Always assume the person is still in the present moment. If they're talking about it with a level of, they're obviously still in it to some degree and from an experiential level. So rather than try to talk them, you know, well, that's stupid and and lucky for you, you got out. Mm. Um, Not really, because they're still there. Right. Even if they're talking about it in past tense, if they're talking about it with a level of emotion that is pretty powerful, they're still there. Definitely. Definitely. To err on the fact that they're probably still in pain and they're probably still there. And the anger is, stoking the anger is good for a minute until it's not. Until you start getting on that whole outrage fatigue and, and you know, the, the, the self-righteousness and the, you know, basically taking on the same position they had towards your kind, towards them. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is a human trait throughout all of history, right? Yeah. Oh, zeal. Zeal is an ugly thing. As well as the powerless who gain power, then exerting that power over the, their former... Oppressor. Mm-hmm. Oppressors, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So yes. We just repeat the same mistakes mm-hmm. over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and then what advice do you have for the people that are that are, maybe they're just now starting to experience some doubts, right? Just the beginning of the cracks are happening. What should they be looking at, uh, consuming? What should they be doing? Okay. First off, they need to keep themselves safe. Absolutely. 
keep themselves safe. If they're in an environment that is not welcoming to that type of thing, they need to get into an environment somewhere, somehow, at least briefly for a little while to talk about this type of thing where mm -hmm. they can be safe. Don't put themselves in danger. If all of a sudden they think that they find something new, they're going to go up against a, you know, a, a pack of people who are going to defend what they believe very, very strongly. And they're yes. going to get ugly and they're going to get hurt. Right. Straight up. They're going to get hurt. So just go find some place where they can actually start asking questions, um, preferably to a place that won't give you answers. <laughs> so that's quite wise. It was oddly enough, that was part of my whole deconversion, deconstruction, de, I don't know whatever the heck this happened. Um, I stumbled into an Episcopal church and I started having questions and they said, that's a really good question. I wonder what the answer is. Mm, yeah. And I'm expecting after years and years of, you know, the indoctrination, well, this is what this says and this is what this says. And they hand you a stack of books and off you go. And they say, hmm, I wonder what the answer is. And so they never told me what the answer was. And, they, and then you go in there and you find out what the answer is. And da, 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 that's very interesting. Tell me more about that. Well, this is all I know at this time. Well, I found this. What do you think about that? Mm, yeah. They didn't. And they already knew an answer, but they wouldn't give me that answer. Right. And that was beautiful. That's the safest thing they can do is to go someplace that no, your questions will not be answered, but they'll be welcomed. That's brilliant. That's what saved me, to perf be perfectly honest with you. In fact, that's in some degree what saved my even notion of spirituality. Hmm. One of the things I observe in people is that there's kind of a first wave, and I don't necessarily mean it in time, but there's the type of personality who is going to rationally work themselves through the logical inconsistencies and come out on the other side all on their own. Yeah. They're the Lone Ranger. They're going to do that on their own. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some people where just what you've described, they've got questions and maybe they are lucky enough to be in a situation where somebody gives them the space to ask those questions and to seek out the answers on their own. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we're in this moment in time, the secularization of, of society, which I hope will end up being a net positive, but we're going to go through this growing pains mm -hmm. where we have the rise of the, those marking none of the above, mm -hmm. this huge group of people that don't have a built-in community, don't have someone to walk them through. I'm trying to get to a question. Sorry, I'm pontificating. <laughs> no, no, this is good. I'm, I'm totally buying into it. I'm totally, I'm loving it. What do you see for uh, this, this younger generation that's coming up? How are they going to find community? How are they going to examine themselves and, and be spiritual, whatever definition? Whatever spiritual is. Yeah, yeah, whatever that means. If they were to do that, and they're the, the masses of the duns, as it were, mm -hmm. um, or the nuns, nuns, it's hard to define, the, really look at the difference between the two, although there is a significant difference, believe it or not. Sure. Um, it's more of the idea of, I have... And, and they, and let's just say they came from a cultural Christian or a cultural religious background. It wasn't necessarily an indoctrination type thing. Mm -hmm. There are people out there that are like that. They're going to find other ways to connect on other things that are still of a core value to them. Mm -hmm. um, connecting on those ways and in healthy ways is really good. You know, just because you believe this way and somebody else believes that way. I mean, if we can get, less polarized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I think of times back when my mom would have dinner parties and the hordes of these couples would come in and we'd have the stuffed olives and all whatever they had in the seventies. I mean, it was a hot mess. Yeah. God love them. Um, <laughs> the weenies in the crock pot bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you'd hear them talk downstairs. And even if, even if a candidate was brought brought up in conversation, it was like, oh, well, I'm voting for so-and-so. And, -so. and that, it left it at that. It wasn't, didn't turn into this, you know, fight where we're throwing the weenies across the room. Right, you know? yeah. It was just, oh, well, that's very interesting and da-da-da-da-da. And I miss those days. I miss the, the where we can just have a, a simple dialogue. And so the new wave of people that are coming out that don't have community, that don't have any other things, there are still things that they can get involved in that are going to be congruent with their values. 
when they mm-hmm. really tap into, well, what is the one thing that if I were to lose, I'd be done? Mm-hmm. And once they can answer that question for themselves and they can find other people who share that similar, may not be on that strength, but may be able to for the level of resonance, then they're going to have their communities. Now, even within those communities, you're going to have people who are having stronger ideas on you than on other things. And they may be a little bit more vocal. Um, I say this, um, I'm part of a CrossFit group here in town and there is a member in the CrossFit group who is very religious, very, very, very religious. (laughs) yes very religious very (laughs) religious um and he even has um wad and worship on every other sunday yeah yeah so there it is um i went to a couple of them again to practice this equanimity thing and uh it it was a, a difficult experience for me because he kept going on and on about, you know, somebody stuck in the sin of homosexuality and da, 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 da. and I'm just sitting oh, there thinking, wow. okay, breathe deeply, breathe deeply, breathe deeply. Don't get into this. This is not the time or the place. This is his show. So let him run his show. And there it is. It, it, it is hard. I, I, you know, my, I have believing family, so I find myself in church quite often and the, you're a kind soul. <laughs> yes. Well, and you obviously value family. There's nothing wrong with going. Yeah. I, I do. Yeah. And and it's because I love my wife and my family and my extended family and virtually everyone in my, <laughs> what I find the most difficult is the recognition of the manipulation. What used to, you know, just seem as normal. And this, I mean, beyond uh, just a religious perspective, right? I, I let's set that aside for mm-hmm. a moment, but the manipulative tactics. Yes. And they just are so glaring to me now. And it's it's very difficult to not just jump up and <laughs> Jay accuse. Exactly. Well, and then, and then I sit there and I think to myself, oh, shit, I did that. <laughs> yes. No, definitely. Yeah, no. Yes, exactly. And the fingers are definitely pointed back my direction. Oh, my gosh. And then I just want to go hide in the bathroom for the rest of the service. <laughs> Often do. <laughs> yeah. So that is, a, I, I find that a, an incredibly enlightening experience of just and I'm glad you pointed it out, of also recognizing what I used to do as well and kind of owning, being able to own that mm-hmm. and, and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was an ass of high order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> that is right. Just like Paul, the, uh, the greatest ass of all hey, asses. I tell you, if you can acknowledge and own your ass hattery, man, that is you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You're probably not in my office either. <laughs> Kathleen, I think we could probably talk for hours. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to tell people how they can get in touch with you, how they might engage with your work. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, You can go to kbshannon.com. That's my uh, actual, my psychotherapy page, or you can go to spiritualtraumarecovery.com. That's where that goes into the spiritual trauma uh, bit and how and ways that you can recover and things of that nature. I am in the course of developing uh, an online course. I'm doing some speaking this week and in the next few weeks on the art of forgiveness Mm. particularly self-forgiveness, um, especially when you look at it, looking at it in a uh, religious context, forgiveness is often shoved down our throats that we're supposed to forgive and forgive and forgive. And in, there are a number of articles that actually refer to that type of forgiveness as being an abuse trigger. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, I go into that and I go into what is forgiveness really? And it, I mean, what, what does it mean to actually make a good apology, a really good apology Mm -hmm. as in something that is actually going to be seen, heard and felt by the other person. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It's the fact that you realize that you were an asshat and you don't want to hurt another person. Right. And that person who already has been wounded is now being asked to forgive. I'd never thought that is a, is a good, you know, forgive and set yourself free. No, no, no. (laughs) Forgiveness is a transaction. Just, just so you know, and including self-forgiveness, the notion of, you know, and to use the the Christian vernacular, what must I do to be saved Mm -hmm. is how can I save the relationship with myself? Yes. What can I do to make amends to myself for duping myself, 
for whatever it is that I've done to myself, especially in terms of religious trauma and whatnot. And we talk about how did I let myself get into that craziness? What part is really wanting that apology? And what does it need to hear and see and feel so that it will know that you're going to keep it safe next time? The concept that I try to thread the needle with is something I call secular grace. Mm. Uh, Why I try to do this, I don't know, because it just basically triggers everyone in every direction. But what I mean by that is what we've been discussing, giving people the benefit of the doubt, actually listening to them, providing acceptance without necessarily condoning. This idea of just redeeming the word grace, to be graceful, right? And it's it's the aspirational nature of the moniker graceful atheist. I'm not saying that I am. I'm saying I'm trying to be. And that people, as human beings, we need that. Uh, but I would love to have you on another time and, and have you talk to us about what actual forgiveness looks like and, and the toxic nature of the dark side of grace, which I completely acknowledge exists. So. Yeah. So we'll definitely have to have you back on soon. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. And giving grace to oneself. How hard is that? Mm, yes. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for being on the Graceful Atheist podcast. Thank you so much for having me. thoughts on the episode. As you can see, Kathleen has a very down-to-earth perspective on religious trauma. You can find her work at kbshannon.com and spiritualtraumarecovery.com. We'll have links in the show notes. I think I was most struck by her description of finding a safe place to ask questions. And to quote her advice, find a space that is safe to ask the questions, preferably one where they will not give you the answers. That is just brilliant advice. I also really like Kathleen's conception of equanimity. That truly is an example of secular grace, of recognizing that we might disagree with one another, but trying to have a real conversation and see the other person in their full humanity, even if we might be diametrically opposed to one another on various fronts. I want to give a quick shout out to Mandy Nicole on Twitter, who, after the recording of this podcast, coined the term prayer reflex. This is exactly what I was describing to Kathleen of the loss of a sense of control. It might be a false sense of control. The sense that I can do something, I can pray. That's what Mandy Nicole is describing as a prayer reflex. I just wanted to give her credit for that. That's an amazing coinage of a term. I want to thank Kathleen B. Shannon for being on the show and sharing her wisdom with us. I encourage you to reach out to Kathleen and her work. And in particular, if you happen to live in Washington State or North Carolina, you can engage Kathleen as a therapist and one that can understand the deconstruction process. As we mentioned at the top of the podcast, remember to fiercely love those who are closest to you in the finite amount of time we have as human beings. Time for some footnotes. The song is a track called Waves by Micaiah Beats. Please check out her music. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to help support the podcast, here are the ways you can go about that. First, help promote it. A podcast audience grows by word of mouth. If you found it useful or just entertaining, please pass it on to your friends and family. Post about it on social media so that others can find it. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This will help raise the visibility of our show. Join me on the podcast. Tell your story. Have you gone through a faith transition? You want to tell that to the world? Let me know and let's have you on. Do you know someone who needs to tell their story? Let them know. Do you have criticisms about atheism or humanism, but you're willing to have an honesty contest with me? Come on the show. If you have a book or a blog that you want to promote, I'd like to hear from you. Also, you can contribute technical support. If you are good at graphic design, sound engineering, or marketing, please let me know and I'll let you know how you can participate. And finally, financial support. There will be a link on the show notes to allow contributions which would help defray the cost of producing the show. If you want to get in touch with me, you can Google Graceful Atheist or you can send email to gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can tweet at me at gracefulatheist. Or you can just check out my website at gracefulatheist.wordpress.com. 
get in touch and let me know if you appreciate the podcast. Well, this has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Grab somebody you love and tell them how much they mean to you. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast.